this message with 1 Corinthians 3, and that is verse 1 to 3. I'll read first out of the New King James, and then I'll read it out of the NIV. Um, Verse 1 says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. In the NIV it says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. He goes on to say in verse 2, I fed you with milk, not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able to For you are still carnal, you are still worldly. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Carnal means fleshly, earthly, worldly, bodily, sensual, and definitely means not spiritual. So Paul is talking to the Corinthians here, and he says, you have been babies in Christ. You have said yes to the Lord, but you lived as babies. And he says, you lived like that and you're still like that because there were divisions among them and envy and strife, there's competition. And he just points out that we as Christians can be in a state of a baby. All of us in this room have been at a stage of being a baby and some of us are still babies. That's what the Bible says. Now, only you can answer that question. Am I still a baby in my faith? Am I still drinking the good milk? Have I not moved on to the T-bone steaks? Have I not moved on to the nice turkey dinner, KFC, some wholesome food, some nice potatoes? Or am I still drinking milk? You might think that is controversial, or maybe I'm confronting you, but I just believe that we as Christians should always reflect when we read something. We always should look first at ourselves. So, what does that speak to me? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why am I citing that verse? To be, and I have preached about this again, but I just felt I have to draw a bit of a more of a picture of what, what it means to be carnal. What it means to be carnal is to worry about what the world says. What it means to be carnal is not to be in the spirit. This verse in Thessalonians says that we, we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. The soul is, I want, I think, and I feel. That's the soulish realm. The flesh, the bodily, goes even further than that. It's very concerned with what the world does. It's very concerned with worldly things. We put our treasure into worldly things, and the Bible is full of that. They don't put your treasure on earthly things, but put it in on heavenly things. So what God desires all of us, including myself, is that we... Live in the Spirit. I have preached about this many, many times. But I just feel to explain that to you. If you're a baby, you're living in your flesh. If you become a son of God or a daughter, you live in the Spirit. So I'm putting this question out there for myself. I'm not pointing any fingers. Um, Are we still babies? Now, remember... Babies in the spirit or babies in followers of Christ has nothing to do with your age. Absolutely nothing. It has nothing to do with your earthly age. It has to do with your spiritual maturity. So you can be a Christian for 60 years and be a baby. You can be a Christian for one year and be a son or a daughter. If you look at the Bible, a lot of these people that he used were actually quite young. Now he can still use older people. There's no There's no stipulation, like he used Abraham. Moses was used until the end of his life, till his very breath, Moses was used by God. Isn't that amazing? There was no retirement, 
There was no golf course. There was preaching the gospel, well, leading the people of Israel till the very, very end. So our earthly age has nothing to do with our spiritual maturity. But the Bible says if you're in the spirit, you become a son and a daughter. And I'll, I'll show you that verse later. Now, as I prepared this week, I was sitting in my room and I asked the Lord to speak to me. And I like to do that. Because when he speaks, it becomes real. He can speak through the scripture, he can speak through a friend, or he can speak right into our heart. And he gave me a picture of a dragonfly. And I have, I have to uh, say I know nothing about dragonflies. I actually quite, I don't like them when they fly by and, you know, the, the wings, that, that noise of the wings, I actually always, I remember as a kid, I never really liked that. But I started looking into a dragonfly and this will blow your socks off. And it did blow my socks off. The dragonfly symbolizes our life as Christians. It's absolutely breathtaking. So the dragonfly does not, doesn't hatch on, on the ground. It doesn't hatch in the trees or in the leaves. The dragonfly fly hatches underwater. So the, the mother will drop the egg while flying into either a stream, pond, whatever. Anything, any water will do. And there the dragonfly grows up. So here in North Dakota, we should know what murky water looks like. Island Lake is not really like clear water beach. I know we would love that, but... It simply isn't. So if you go in there and you, put your, you open your eyes while you're underwater, you'll see a lot of green and murky water. And that's where the eggs are. That's where the, the dragonfly, the nymph, it's called. All the fly fishers would know that name, uh, lives. So what does that represent? Well, under the water, there's not much light, is there? We have some light, but anyone that ever dove deeper into a lake, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. And those critters, those dragonflies, they live at the bottom. So depending on how deep, it's definitely not as bright as at the surface. And I thought that was interesting. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? I'm focusing on the darkness. When we say yes to Jesus, we become babies in Christ, all of us. We are like that dragonfly. We are saved, but we are really babies. I think many in this room would agree that after you said yes to Jesus, there was a learning process. There were some hills and some valleys, and sometimes we had to go around the mountain. Sometimes we had to go twice around the mountain. Sometimes we had to go three times around the mountain. Sometimes we had to go into the wilderness. There's a learning curve. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are, cho you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the light. So what he has done in all of our lives is when we said yes to him, his desire for us is to come out of the darkness and live in the light. If you... Look up verses about light. I mean, you find so many verses about light. Light in the darkness. The lamp unto our feet. That's his desire, that we live in the light. Now, there's something else that happens. While that nymph is in there, the current takes it. There's a strong current. That nymph is not strong enough to withstand that current. It's not a fish. It's a little, you've got to imagine, it's like a little bug. It has legs, no wings, obviously. And the current takes it. And that reminded me of the verse in Ephesians 4, 14, 15, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every, every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth, in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Wow. So he says, we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro. Reflect upon yourself. What, what do you go through when there is trial? What do you go through 
inside of yourself when there's opposition? What do you go through when there are hard times? What do you go through when you don't hear the Lord speak? Are you tossed and fro by your emotions? Are you tossed and fro by any doctrine that comes along? There are people in the Christian body that look for every new revelation. What they haven't understood is that the best revelation that we have is that Jesus died for us. But they're looking for secret revelations. They're looking for awesome doctrines. And there's nothing wrong with having a revelation. What I'm preaching about is a revelation to me and hopefully to you. But he says, don't be tossed and fro by by the trickery of men, by, by people's doctrines. Don't be tossed away, tossed back and forth by your emotions, by COVID-19, by a war in Ukraine, by gas prices going up. He says, grow up. And grow up in what? Not in ourselves, but he says, grow up in all things. That's a big statement. In every aspect of our life, in all things of the Spirit, grow up into him, Jesus Christ, who is the head. So some of these dragonflies, they spend up to seven years underwater. Would you have thought that? So they're never, or for seven years, a long, long time, they're not really in their true calling. They're not really in their true potential. If you compare that nymph to the dragonfly later, there are worlds between them. And so are we as Christians when we don't live in the Spirit. We don't, no matter how smart you are, no matter how strong you are, how good looking, how wealthy, you'll never come to your full potential in your flesh. Discipline can get you very far. And we see that with unbelievers, that they're very disciplined, they're hardworking, and that can get you far in life. But you'll never reach your true potential. So all of us here have the potential of David. All of us here have the potential of Jesus Christ. Think about that. He said, you will do greater things than me. He stands for us. He intercedes for us. Did you know that there was one thing that Jesus never could do? Preach the gospel. Now, before you throw something at me, just think about this. Because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. He couldn't preach the full gospel. He could speak about what will come. And he gave us many parables. But we actually can preach the gospel because he went to the cross and he rose again. So many of us, if we are entangled in this world, if we are entangled in our flesh, if we are entangled in all these things and all these pressures, we don't come to our full potential. Not even that. But there's no fruit. I'll explain that. But first, I want to read Ephesians 5.14. It says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. That's for every one of us. All of us have have been in in moments in our life where we, we were sleeping. We were sleeping in the world. We were not paying attention. We were not alive in the Spirit. So, I said you can't have fruit. The nymph does not reproduce under the water. Mark 4.19 says in that matter, And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That's what it means to be in the fleshly realm. Even if you're excited sometimes. You know, that was a great message. Thank you. If you don't pay attention, if you don't take that message home, you pray about it, you ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to your own understanding of it, you hold on to it and you practice it, the the cares of the world can choke that. The cares of the world can choke that. There were people that were healed and they didn't follow Jesus. Why? Because their body was touched. Their flesh was healed, but their spirit man wasn't necessarily touched. There are many examples of that in the Bible, and I, probably a few of you have even seen that, where God did an, an amazing miracle, a moment of breakthrough for a person, and then you, you see them walk away. And you're like, wait, 
Don't you remember what you received? You were so happy. You were crying for, full of joy and praising the Lord. But it has to be in the Spirit. We are so weak in the flesh. We are so under the power of this world if we are in the flesh. And just one more verse. And I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures. In Haggai 2.19 it says, Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the vine, the wine, sorry, and the fig tree and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. The moment we choose to walk in the Spirit, that's where the blessing starts. That's where the true blessing starts here on earth. So he says, Is the seed still in the barn? Now a lot of you farmers are waiting and are anxious to get on the field. And maybe some of you have seeded yet and some haven't. But you certainly wouldn't leave the seed in the barn if the weather would be great for seeding. Same in our spiritual walk. Every person here has a barn full of seed. Every person in this room. And that seed goes along with your calling, with your potential that in Christ, not in yourself, in Christ. And all that God wants you to do is take that bag of seed and go sow it. And you'll never ever be a happier person. True fulfillment watching a person giving their life to Christ, helping a brother that's on the ground, fixing a family situation, healing for a person that has no more, uh, uh, praying for a person that has no more hope and that person gets healed. That fulfillment, you, you can't put any price tag on that. Now, the Bible is not against making money. The Bible is not against being wealthy. The Bible simply says, watch where your heart is. Where is your heart? Is your heart in the bank account? Or is your heart in Jesus? Is God first or is the money first? And that's what the Bible cares about. A lot of prosperity people preach about Abraham and say, well, Abraham was wealthy, so I can be wealthy. Well, Abraham never preached the gospel. He didn't make money with the gospel. He made money as a businessman. He was a capitalist. He started with so many cows and made more cows. Now God blessed his business and used them in many ways to bless Israel, but he didn't preach the gospel to make money. Just a side note. So, there's one other thing that I would like to say. When that nymph is in the water, there are a lot of predators. If you ever put your fishing rod into Island Lake, you'll pull out some big pikes. They are big. And I mean, they can even eat ducklings and all kinds of things. I saw a picture the other day. There was a, uh, a catfish, I think, that had eaten a, a beaver baby. But it was, I mean, it was big. So there are a lot of predators where the nymph is living. And it's just a tiny nymph. It's not in, in their full potential. It's just walking around there, getting tossed back and forth. No, not much light. Doesn't see exactly where it's going. That's who we are. Now, this is awesome. The University of Toronto has done a study on this. And they had put the nymph in an aquarium and they put a glass between it and there was, a, I think, a predator, either a trout or a pike, was right next to, next to that nymph. So that nymph saw the pike its whole life and they put holes in it so that the smell actually would crisscross. Now, the, the, the fish couldn't get to it, but what they have found is that it's about four to five times higher chance for the nymph to die before it ever becomes a dragonfly. He said the nymph was actually so stressed, and I think people are listening now, the nymph was so stressed that it died early. It never came to its full potential. It died as a nymph, compared to the one that was not in an environment of predation. That's exactly what happens in this world. That stress, that busyness, that fear that rules outside of here can keep you from becoming a mature Christian. And it's your choice to go to the surface. It's your, your choice to follow the Spirit. Now, He doesn't require from us to figure all of it out. He meets us there. When I was young, I had no concept of any of this. I had no theology. But when I met Jesus, when he got hold of my life and I encountered the Holy Spirit, he guided me. 
Were there moments of failure? Yes. Were there moments of where I did mistakes or misunderstood something? Absolutely. But he's faithful to guide you in, in the spirit. Absolutely faithful. When you make the choice and say, Holy Spirit, I yield to you. I'll give you my carnal mind. All these thoughts that are nagging me day and night, all this stress, all the fear, all the anxiousness, all the worry, all the greed, selfishness. I'll give that to you. I put that at the feet or at your feet, at the bottom of the cross, and I say, Lord, take that and show me what it means to walk in the Spirit. And you have to experience it yourself because there's no real good way, in my opinion, to explain it. It is something you have to experience yourself. It's like the same thing when you want to bring a, a person to Christ and say, well, if you would just know the love of Jesus, and you try to explain it, well, it's like, you know, and we always come short. Even as Christians, we can't really explain it. It's unfathomable. It, it's, you, you cannot fathom the love of Jesus. It's not, you can't explain it with words. It's the same thing with walking in the Spirit. So that nymph, under that pressure, in that environment of the flesh, being a nymph, the Christian in the environment of being a baby, is very vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. Is very vulnerable to the cares of this world. Absolutely vulnerable. We don't have wings. We can't fly away. And they actually found out, too, that the nymph that they took out and that they placed outside to go through the process of becoming a dragonfly, that those that were in predation oftentimes died in the process, which is not natural. Well, is in, a, in a natural environment, if there's a nymph in, in, in predation, that is natural. But it's not, it's, it's not its potential. It's not what's supposed to happen. That nymph is supposed to come out and become a dragonfly. So, how do we become sons and daughters? We'll go back to the dragonfly. At some point in its life, it decides to go to the surface. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9. That's what happened in that moment. God's ways are a lot higher than our fleshly ways. If we make the decision to go to the surface, we're actually gaining elevation in the, in the natural, in the physical, in this, in this example. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. Make that decision. If you haven't made that decision, make it today. It's almost like stepping out of a window. You know, leaning yourself out of the window and hoping somebody's going to catch you. And he's faithful to catch you. That trust game, you know, when a person is behind you and wants to catch you, you have to trust that person. That's, that's what you have to do. You have to yield and surrender to the Spirit. Now then the nymph will grab a leaf and it will attach itself to a leaf. It will cling itself to a leaf or a stick. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Cling to what is good in your life. And that will actually happen automatically. That is a natural response as you make the decision to walk in the Spirit. He will guide you into what is good and what is true and what is love. That's his job. We don't have to come up with that. He'll guide you. We just have to follow and say, I trust you, God. Now, now it gets exciting. Overnight, it leaves its own old skin. It leaves its old skin behind, and the wings start to come out. Ephesians 4, 22, 24 says, That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in what? In the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness. See how it says true righteousness and true holiness. That's what happens in your life. You suddenly walk away from that old man. 
that was very concerned about the flesh, that was very concerned about doing things in the flesh, that was very concerned about what the world said. You put that one away, and it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. As the wings develop, blood, blood is pumping into the wings. As we make a commitment to Jesus, as we follow him, his blood pours into our lives. He changes us from the inside out. He makes us able to fly with him. He makes us able to reach higher levels, higher things, things of heaven, not of earth. And that's the work of the blood. Yes, the blood is salvation. 100%. That's the first step. That's, we love the blood for that. But the blood continues to work in our lives. It continues to work in our lives until we meet him. That's why it says righteousness in holiness. The only way that any of us in this room can achieve righteousness and holiness is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not in our works. It's not in our flesh. It is only through the blood. True righteousness and true holiness. That's why he uses that, because there are a lot of religious Christians in the, those times, and even today, it looks right on the outside, but it ain't right on the inside. And he said, you want the true stuff. You want the good stuff. And that's the blood of Jesus. Only through the blood can we achieve righteousness, because he has paid the price. Now you'll find another thing that is very interesting. Now that the dragonfly has become a dragonfly, now it mates with a partner in the air. While flying, they mate. That's the only time in the life of a dragonfly where it actually produces fruit. As a nymph, it couldn't produce fruit. Same in our lives. As we start flying, as we are, what, what, what does the flying represent? It's being guided by the Holy Spirit. As we are guided by the Holy Spirit, as we walk in the Spirit, we actually produce fruit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, and there's a long list. That's the fruit. That's all, all of us want that. And all of us have been touched in our lives by a person that brought forth fruit. You can, you can talk to one person, they'll tell you about the love of Jesus. It will not touch your heart. It will go in and out. You try to talk to another person that walks in the Spirit, and the Spirit, through that person, makes it real to you. They can have the exact same message. One relies on his knowledge. The other one relies on the Spirit of the Lord. So now, what is so awesome about the wings? The dragonfly is an absolute skillful hunter. It is a fantastic flyer. Every wing of the dragonfly is controlled independently. So one wing can do something else than the other three, and they can all independently do something else. That allows the dragonfly to hover, to fly backwards while facing forward, to fly upside down, to go straight up, like a, like a helicopter, and straight down. So you and I, if we walk in the Spirit, we become aerial acrobats. That's what we become, all of us. And that's his desire, that we can stop and hover, and are sensitive to his guidance, and then he says, go up, and we go up, and he says, go down, go down. And if we're real discouraged, he says, now fly upside down for a while, to get all that stuff out of your head. All right? And he does that, and it becomes like a dance. And it becomes like a dance, and it's an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit that always will lead us to Jesus Christ. That's his job. He'll never make a platform for himself. He glorifies Jesus. That's what he wants to do through us. So you and I can become extremely agile. 
you suddenly don't hold on to these things anymore. Oh, you know, I love that TV show, and I know it's just all junk. I have to watch it. You suddenly don't care that much about that anymore. You suddenly don't care that much about where you live anymore. Since I have received the Holy Spirit, I have moved about, I don't know, 15 times, three times across the world. Now you think, well, that's crazy. That sounds more like chaos to me. And a lot of non-believers actually told me that. You say, you, what do you mean you bought your parents' house and sold it a year and a half later? Well, because the Spirit spoke and blessed our socks up in the process of it. Made me come to America. So you feel like you're getting a lot more flexible. You don't care about these boxes anymore. You don't care about these traditions anymore. You don't care about these fleshly, satisfying things anymore. Because they're actually cheap fun. Really is cheap fun. There's no long-lasting fruit. There's no eternal value in any of that thing. Now, you say, well, John, you go hunting. Yes, I do. God wants us to enjoy this life. He doesn't want us to be sad monks in a, and there's nothing wrong with monks there, godly monks and nuns in this world. But he wants to lead us into that. He doesn't want us ourselves to lead us into that type of life. If he has that calling for your life, he'll give you grace to live it. He'll give you a calling to live that. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Actually, I'll just give you one verse about the hovering, the flying backwards, one of my favorite verses, and I've preached, I've, I mentioned this one before, John 3, 8. The b- wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's talking about that dragonfly, which represents us. The wind comes. Nobody knows really where it's coming from, but you follow it. It doesn't really make much sense in your carnal mind. No sense most times. But you follow it because that's his guiding, guiding in your life. Last night I was laying in front of the toilet. And I was wondering how I get Dan to preach today because I thought I'm not going to be able to preach in the morning. So I don't know if we ate something wrong, but my wife and both and I were really sick. I slept one hour. As I laid in front of the toilet and thought about tomorrow, and you guys know that I love to preach, and I take that serious, thinking, okay, well, I'll ask Dan to preach and whatnot. The voice of the Lord spoke clearly, as loud, loud, loudly inside of myself, you're going to preach tomorrow. I said, okay, I'll preach tomorrow. So I p- prayed, and the sickness left. I'm still a bit tired and still a bit weak. But I didn't feel like preaching today. Not at all. My wife knows me, and she knows are you sure about this? Says, yeah, God said it. So then she already knows. All right. He's, he's not going to be convinced otherwise. I didn't feel like it. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, God may, may ask you to do something and you don't feel like it. Maybe on Tuesday they ask you to do something and you don't feel like it. And you have a choice to make. You say, okay, I'm going to listen to that small, still voice. People look at me with big eyes. Tell my wife, I'll do this and this. Or you'll tell your husband tomorrow, you'll do this and this. And they'll look at you. Maybe even confront you. Maybe even oppose you. But are you going to follow that voice? Because that voice will bring you to your full potential in Jesus Christ. That voice will bring you to a fruitful life. That voice might tell you to go up or down or backwards. Isn't it interesting that the dragonfly goes backwards while facing forward? I shared my testimony with you guys last week. It's very briefly. I'm actually writing a book about it because it's so complex. There are so many moments that I would have... N- it would be impossible without the Holy Spirit. Absolutely impossible to get out of that situation. One, for instance, was when we got out of that group, that manip- manipulating group, one thing he told me, and it was so clear, he says... Don't run away from it. Walk away from it. And instantly I understood in the spirit, if I turn my head from the whole thing and I just run in fear and anger and disgust or whatever, I will not learn one thing. 
But he said, look at it for what, what happened and walk away from it and let me tell you what was right and what was wrong through my word. And that's what he did. And that's what he can do. He can bring you through. You know, deception is so dangerous because you don't know what is right and wrong anymore. You don't know what is up and what is down. Your biggest foundation has been attacked, has been cracked. We will, some of us, and we, we see all the pain, we see all the suffering in this world, but we have the privilege to always come back to Jesus, the rock. If you experience heartache in your life, if you experience, the, you, can, you can fill the list, there's so many things that might be hard in our life. We have the privilege to always go back. We have the, his faithfulness to always go back to him. But deception steals that from you because it actually deceives your very foundation. So you are really lost, really lost. And it's a really scary thing. There are people that have left that group that don't even want to talk about it. They have been out for many years. They still don't want to talk about it because they're still bound in fear. But thanks to the Holy Spirit, he brought me through it. He brought my wife through it. Now, last week I mentioned even about my wife that she had left me at a time. And I didn't say that to blame her. I most likely would have done the same thing in her situation. That's how strong deception can be. You don't know what is right from wrong anymore. So you need the Holy Spirit. Even, even if you think, I'll never be deceived, this world is so full of darkness it is so full of traps. It is so full of people that want to see you fall. The enemy. You really need the helper. You really need the comforter to walk in the spirit, to become an adult Christian. It says in Romans, for as many as are led, that's 8.14, very famous, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. He doesn't talk about babies anymore. Will you become a son and a daughter? That's, that speaks of maturity. That doesn't speak of childhood. If you just trust him, if you just let him guide you, if, if you stop living in the flesh and ask him every day, help me, Lord, to live in the Spirit. Guide me in the Spirit. I'll tell you another testimony. When I left the group, I put in my resignation, and Mary, Mary was on the way up to Canada. I prayed another bold prayer. I said, God, I don't believe you're in this. They had a business. They had a business and they was attached to a ministry, which is always dangerous. Looking back now, I, I know more about that. But I said, God, you're not in this. I ask you to pull the plug on this whole operation. Within two hours, every single bank account of them was frozen. The same night, all their vehicles were repoed and the business went bankrupt within 12 hours after praying that prayer. And I couldn't even tell my wife about it because she was still were very uh, obviously influenced by that, which I understand. I would have been the same way. So God listens when you pray in the Spirit. He'll do amazing miracles. So that is really my message. Do we want to live as babies or do we want to become aerial acrobats in the kingdom of God? And you really have to take hold of this and live it out. I can't do that for you. Pastor Fred can't do that for you. Billy Graham couldn't have done that for you. You have to take a hold of it and say, I want more. I am done with status quo. I want to see fruit in my life. More fruit, perhaps even. Maybe you see already fruit. And you say, I just want more. The key is in the spirit. It's not in the flesh. Not in the soulish. It's in the spirit. And like I said, Go out and experience it for yourself. That's key. So that is really my message for today. I hope it blessed you. It, it really blessed me to see the change of the dragonfly and how that speaks of our life as a Christian. So I'm just going to finish in prayer. Um, thank you, Heavenly Father, for everyone that came today. I thank you for all the families here. I thank you for the young generation, the old generation, the 
the halfway in between generation. I thank you that we can be a family, Lord. And no matter how old or how young we are, we be can become sons and daughters. We can walk in the Spirit. And I just ask you, Lord, to put that urge, that hunger for more on every person's heart today. That you would fan that flame that maybe has been there before and that has gotten lost. That you would fan that flame that, that wants more, that wants to give more, that wants to receive more from the Lord. That you would make it a, 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 a hot furnace, Lord, a hot furnace in all of our hearts. I just ask you that you would take all the reserve, reserve feelings away that people may have when they hear walking in the Spirit. Maybe they have even made bad experiences. I just ask you to take all that away and that, just, that you would take your Holy Spirit and just make them real. Make him real to them, Lord. That your Holy Spirit becomes real to every person in this room. Even the young ones. Even the teenagers, Lord. Because we know that he's our guide. That he's our comforter and our helper. And make all of us mature in you, Jesus. That we could take this message and live it. That we could really live it and not just talk about it, Lord. That's our desire. So encourage everyone to do that. Move upon their hearts, Lord. Move upon their minds. Get all the stuff out that's not supposed to be there. And put your truth and your love in there. Don't let us miss it, Lord. Don't let us stay a nymph. Make us bold flyers in the spirit, Lord. Don't let us miss it. Let us experience it. In Jesus' name, amen.